Thank you, Phil. Uh, thanks, everybody. It's a Friday afternoon. It's the last day of the conference. Hopefully, you got your sugar or your coffee or maybe happy hour started. I don't know. Um, but here, I'm here to talk about how to make a Niantic-style game experience uh, using Lightship. So as Phil mentioned, my name is Braxton Lansill, and I'm a partner engineering lead on the partner engineering team. Uh, essentially, I work with our external developers to make sure that using Lightship is a pleasure, that it's going well, support, uh, being a feedback mechanism to our product teams, uh, and then doing stuff like this, get to do talks. Uh, as you saw some of my comrades up here earlier, Mar and Brent and Jamaica and everybody, Helena. Um, it's really a fun gig. So I think to talk about how to build a gamer yeah, like that, really, really cheesy, although it's still the Niantic. That's just an image. That's my joke, yeah. Um, so, so to talk about how to build a Niantic style game uh, or an app, app experience, I think it's important first to define exactly what is the Niantic style. Um, you know, Niantic's mission, as you've heard throughout the week or you've probably heard before, uh, three really key pillars, and those being exploration, encouraging our players and users of our games and apps to get out and explore the world, uh, explore their surroundings, see their local areas. Uh, you know, as gamers, sometimes it's hard to do that, which leads to our next uh, piece, which is exercise. So again, that exploration, not just sitting on your couch and playing games, but also getting up and exploring that world, physically walking and moving. And then the social aspect, uh, that picture is from a Pigo Fest. Uh, you know that uh, a lot of our games and apps are built around those experiences and experiencing these, those things together in real life. So we all love uh, the internet and playing together online, but also we encourage people to get out and experience things in the real world together. And we talk about this mission uh, and how our games and apps facilitate that. I really think of two key pillars. And the first one uh, are geolocated experiences. So if you all were here for the maps talk a moment ago, you'll see a lot of similar uh, sentiment here. Um, these are several of our games, and you'll notice a common theme, just like with in the maps talk, that all these things, uh, you'll see that we all have a mapping component to them. Um, you know, Pigo is probably our most popular game, and you're very familiar with the top-down map, displaying locations around you, helping you discover the world around you, um, and getting people um, to go to these locations and have experiences that you can only have at those locations. So whether that's a Pokemon gym that made you get off the couch, walk two blocks, and then have a special experience in a battle, or whether that's a very custom thing that is a, a triggers a very curated experience, it's getting people to discover the world around them. And the other key pillar I think of is augmented reality. Um, obviously, that's what this conference is all about. That's why we're probably all here. Um, but you'll see that we've integrated augmented reality into our games and apps, uh, you know, ever so slowly more and more, especially with the launch of Paradox. So shout out to the Paradox team who was up here earlier. Um, but that's our, our first AR first game being predominantly in AR, that being the main portion of the game. But that's really bringing the digital and the physical into one experience and creating that immersion. So, uh, you know, best case scenario, you're not even realizing what is what anymore. Everything is reacting as one, uh, one true experience. So as we built these games and apps, uh, you know, we have some experience in seeing what works, what doesn't work, building technology, failing gracefully, learning uh, you know, what's the best way to build these things. So we're taking all that technology uh, from our games and we've brought it to you with Lightship. So you can run with it with your own creativity. And today I wanna walk through an experience, show Lightship in action. So we'll walk through some examples and then talk about exactly how that works with Lightship, what APIs, what features are used, uh, hopefully give you some inspiration. So you're thinking about your experience or your app that you're building, uh, you can kind of piece together, oh, okay, that's how I would build that. That's how I would do that thing. Um, so without further ado, let's dive in. First, uh, we'll talk about uh, kind of like a, almost like a fake gamer app here. We'll start with like user navigation piece, thinking about, um, you know, that overhead map or how do we get a player or a user to uh, go somewhere, how do we guide them there? And then once they get there, we'll say, okay, you've, you've gotten off the couch, you've walked to this location, we're going to reward you with this cool, awesome AR experience, how do we do that? Um, now that you're here and you're in AR, let's give you something really, really cool, really curated and special and accurate. Uh, using our visual positioning system. And then real quick, we'll kind of rewind to how do we build these things uh, because uh, when we talk about these features, it sounds like it can be really, really hard, but it doesn't have to be. 
So first in the user navigation piece. Um, again, more screenshots of seeing like overhead maps and uh, from NBA All World and Ingress and uh, an in-progress demo there. Um, so using Lightship, we can do several things in, in the realm of mapping and navigation. Uh, the first, which you may have heard about if you're here for the previous talk, uh, is using the Lightship Maps SDK. That's being able to get that overhead map rendered on the map to show the player where they are in the world and the, uh, the environment around them. And then placing locations of interest on top of that map. So saying, hey, we know that there is this statue, this mural, this uh, store, whatever that may be, close to you, and pinning that on the map to help show them uh, that they're actually in their neighborhood and what's around them. And then also providing those images. So hey, there is a statue there. So on the far right one, uh, we also have images of those areas. So saying, you're looking for the statue, and here is the exact picture of what you're looking for to help guide them there. Uh, so first, talking about integrating maps. Um, you know, in the last talk, you saw how simple it can be. This is just a, a short screenshot or screen video showing exactly how easy that is and how it takes less than a minute. Uh, bringing in the maps SDK, you see we have a package for it. So we've, we've downloaded that package. Great, that's a couple of clicks. Uh, we go to find our package. Once the maps package is in, we also have several samples available. So kickstart your, uh, your map building if you want to, uh, things like an orthographic camera or placing objects on top of the map. So a couple of clicks, we've got the map in there. Okay, uh, just as Brent showed earlier, let's bring it actually it maps into our project, uh, into our scene, which is a couple more clicks. And I'm gonna do that by using a prefab that is literally called Lightship Map. So boom, Lightship Map is in our scene. And guess what? We also have a prefab called Orthographic Camera, so I don't have to think about a top-down camera. I just want to be able to see the map that's going to be on a plane and the camera looking down at it. So I've now I've dragged in two prefabs. I've uh, assigned one thing in the inspector, um, and just like that, one more step is where I'm going to assign a non-URP material because Maps is URP by default, and I don't have a URP project here. So those four steps, um, and once we've brought in the non-URP theme, I'm gonna hit the play button and you'll be able to see a map with just a few clicks. And I really wanna drive home how simple that was. That this, I think this video is about a minute, 15 seconds long, and we already have a map uh, of the area where the user is rendered in the Unity scene. At that point, you know, the world's your oyster to customize it and do whatever you want with it, but just in one minute, uh, I was able to get a map actually into my scene. Super, super easy. So now that we have uh, the map in our scene, we want to actually populate that map with locations around us. Um, we do this using what we call a VPS coverage API, which is also mentioned earlier. And the VPS coverage API allows you to find locations that we as Niantic have data and knowledge of uh, in your surrounding area. So some key fields that we keep track of in our end, um, every location has an identifier, uh, latitude, longitude, the name of the location, uh, an image, so earlier when we showed a little image of what the user is looking for, we provide that. And then the default anchor we'll get into a little bit later. But again, just illustrating how easy it is to use this, um, a, few, a few functions here that are just like, I, I wrote and they work and they're super, super easy. Um, but in like four lines, 10 lines of code there, um, you can see that all it's doing is saying, hey, get me locations that Niantic knows uh, near me and return those to me. And then from there, you can actually populate the map. You can do whatever it is you want to do with that data um, and help users guide them to a place, show them what's around their area, uh, whatever it is you want to do. So now we can think about how we're going to marry that to the actual Lightship map piece as we're building this experience of navigating around the world around us. Okay, so like I mentioned, we now have, because of the coverage API, we now have latitude, longitude, and coordinates of locations near us. Uh, we also have our Lightship map that we brought into our scene. Um, so now, let's, how do we take these locations and actually put them on the map? Um, in the maps talk earlier, we saw a probably better way to do this, but I'm gonna show you how, it is, how easy it is just to prototype it and get it working, again, in about four lines of code. Um, essentially, in, in these three lines, we're saying, hey, this target variable is one of our VPS coverage API locations. And we're saying, hey, give me your latitude, longitude coordinates. Um, luckily, our Lightship Maps uh, has a function called lat long to scene. So we're saying, translate these latitude, longitudinal coordinates to where that is in our Lightship Maps scene. And then we're just instantiating a prefab. So we've taken a coverage API uh, piece of data, 
we had translated that to where it should be on our map in our scene. And just like that, we can populate things on our map. So combining those two things, um, you get something very, very simple like this, where uh, this is in my neighborhood in Seattle, which is saying, um, hey, here's the map, here's where I'm at, I'm by my house. Uh, here are all the places, the VPS locations that Niantic knows about um, near where I am or where I was. Um, you can scroll through those, you can check them out, you can see the images of what those locations actually are, the names of them, how far away you are. Um, in those, you know, probably grand total of 25 lines of code, we've got a map in the scene on the screen, we've got locations being populated on top of the map. Um, and, you know, the full experience could be something like, hey, you found these locations, now go navigate to them. Let's actually use VPS and localize. Um, we haven't talked about VPS yet, so we'll dive into that shortly. But the idea being, we've been looking for this statue, uh, we had a map to show you where it is, you've now arrived, and you can do your thing. And we'll talk more about how to do that thing here in a minute. Okay, so on our journey here, we started with a map, and that navigational piece of having a user start somewhere and find a location around them. We've helped to guide them to that location, and we'll assume now that we've walked around and we've found that location. Um, so now, let's start an actual AR experience. Um, and how to do that is very, very simple as well. So, um, Lightship 3.0 leverages AR Foundation's AR session which if you've used AR Foundation before, is very, very simple to use. Um, and then using Lightship, we can understand the depth and the ordering and uh, semantic labels of the real world around us um, by feeding that camera data to Lightship to our depth modules, uh, which is very, very simple and feeds into AR Foundation's occlusion manager with just a click of a button. So in Lightship's depth estimation uh, module, just want to show a couple screenshots here. If you've used AR Foundation, uh, the bottom screenshot is just a prefab that if you're starting an AR Foundation project, you've probably clicked and dragged that in because that's kind of the basis of getting your AR camera working in your AR session. Um, on top of that, you'll see in the Lightship settings screenshot, uh, once you import Lightship, you get this settings tab, and you'll see that we have several features you can start using just by checking a box. So uh, if we've got an AR Foundation project, we bring in our Lightship settings and boom, we can have uh, depth running, we can have semantic segmentation running, we have our API key set up to use our APIs, um, things that are very, very simple, we try to make it as, as easy as possible to at least get up and going. Um, some of the bonuses of using our depth module alongside AR Foundation uh, is better trained for outdoor environments. As we spoke to earlier with our mission, we have a lot of players uh, play outside, pretty much all of our VPS locations are outdoors. Um, and then our depth module works across many, many modern devices, does not require LiDAR, which I think is a little bit of a differentiator compared to some other technologies out there. So just using Air Foundation and a couple checkboxes, we have now started AR session, we've got to our location, we're in AR. Um, now that we're in AR, I wanna talk about location-based experiences. So you've probably all heard, or maybe not, but some of you have probably heard of VPS, which is our uh, visual positioning system we talk about a lot, uh, and really how that can drive a location-based experience. So we've nav we got the map, we navigated, we started AR, uh, now let's do something really, really cool, and curated and special at this location. Um, so using VPS and Lightship, we can synchronize your location or the user's location to these real, way, real <laughs> real world places of interest uh, that we know about on our back end. Um, because we know 3D data, uh, geo coordinate data, and very, 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 very vivid data on these locations, uh, we can cur curate hyper accurate digital experiences uh, next to them. So we like to tout centimeter precision accuracy or another analogy we like to use is imagine you're, once you synchronize these locations, it's like you're in a snow globe where everything 10 meters in the radius is going to be super, super accurate because we know right where you are because you synchronize to the location we know where that's at. And to create those experiences, uh, we also have some uh, nice tools and APIs so you can create, save, update, delete content around that. So you can share those experiences with other people. Maybe I go to a location and I leave a letter, Jamaica walks up, is a different user, reads the letter, shreds it up, now it's gone. You can handle all that uh, using uh, VPS and some of our anchor management tools. 
So this example uh, was the end of the example I just showed a video of. So now we actually have gotten to a location and VPS is starting right now. We're trying to localize, we're looking for that statue and you can see almost instantly as the, the statue comes into frame, um, we, uh, we successfully localize. So our backend is saying, hey, we're looking for the statue, uh, you know, we're taking in the camera data, camera frame data and trying to match it. And as soon as it's in frame, uh, it does match almost immediately, which is awesome. Um, and just slaps a little check mark on there. So uh, when it works, it works really, really well. Uh, another small snip snippet here showing how to integrate the visual positioning system. Pretty, uh, pretty simple overall. You can see again uh, my hyper commented code that I like to try to write. Uh, just a few functions here to start VPS and to keep track of its localization state. So um, won't walk through all this, but I just want to illustrate that uh, as long as uh, one thing to call out though is that default target here, um, that localization target came from the coverage API. So you can imagine a flow where uh, in the earlier example of I'm a user, uh, I've said, hey, I want to navigate to that Leif Erikson statue. Um, that default anchor, we're going to save that and say, okay, our user's looking for this. Great, because that's how you actually synchronize, localize with VPS and say, hey, we're looking for this uh, location. Um, and in just a few lines of code, we're up and running and we're localizing, trying to sync that location with what we know on our back end. Um, and you can see it's just keeping track of um, if it's uh, completed or failed or, or succeeded. So a couple of uh, things to call out, considerations, design guidelines on building a VPS experience or a location-based experience. Um, I think it all sounds awesome, but it can be difficult to do it right. So uh, a couple of key things, um, guiding users with visual feedback. So whether, whether that's just showing images of the location you're looking for from the coverage API, or whether that's having an arrow or actual navigational path on streets or sidewalks, something that helps them get to where they're going. Um, rewarding users with a special experience these locations. I think, you know, we, uh, as gamers, at least as a gamer myself, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, getting off the couch or actually going outside and doing something, going to the Pokemon gym, sometimes is harder than it seems like it should be. So, you know, reward your players for getting up and doing that. It should be like, they should get there and say, well, okay, I did the thing, now what? Um, think about organic me mechanics to help users use the tech. So, I think this is a great example of uh, a natural mechanic where uh, when the user's phone is pointed down, the map is showing. And as soon as they lift the camera up, they do their thing in the map, now we're back in AR. And you can go back and forth between map or AR. Um, and that's, I think this is one of the coolest examples I've seen um, from our partners at Arcade, a uh, developer studio out in London. Um, but it's a very, very slick way of showing, uh, showing the map and then uh, with like a natural, something natural for a user. It's like looking down at a map, you know, almost like you're holding a real map. Um, shout out to MapQuest back in the day. And then, uh, and then going back into AR as you look up. And then lastly, sometimes it is necessary to help coach the user a little bit, those coaching mechanisms. Uh, we're all in the, if we're in the AR space, we know that technology can be hard to use or hard for users um, to make the technology work because it's so finicky, it needs to be used so perfectly for the technology to actually work. So sometimes, uh, hey user, you know, walk slowly around the VPS location, use your phone back and forth, things like that can be useful if done correctly. But also if you can find a natural way in your game or your app to help them uh, do the thing, to do the scan, uh, I know that Ingress uh, gave a talk this morning that showed um, how they do it and it, it looks like you wouldn't even know that you were scanning something because you feel like you're just playing the game, which is super awesome. It's hard to do, but if you can do it, it's great. Okay, so when you're building location-based content, uh, the old way, when we first started doing this, uh, is just like it sounds, which is, man, it sounds hard to build something in Unity Editor then I'm gonna take a walk, I'm gonna go a few blocks away, go to that Leif Erikson statue by my house, and I'm gonna see what, if it works. Okay, it doesn't work. Well, now I need to like print out some logs. I'm gonna go back, uh, you know, back to my computer three blocks away, try again, go back, didn't work. I'm breaking a sweat, this happened the other day, and then I was like, I don't need to do this because we have tools that prevent you from doing this. I was just being stubborn because I thought I was a perfect coder. Um, anyway, so that all sounds time consuming, and it is if you do it that way, uh, but we have tools, so you don't have to. So. To build these experiences, a uh, few things worth mentioning that try to make your life a lot easier and save you hours and hours. Um, firstly, 
creating that digital content at these VPS locations, uh, we have a uh, remote content authoring workflow. And essentially what that means is I can be in the Unity editor on my computer at home and I can build my experience um, relative to that location. Uh, if that doesn't make too much sense, I'll show what it means in a minute. Um, testing our location-based experience over and over using playback, which if you saw in the other talks, you may have seen what that is, but I'll demonstrate here shortly. And then uh, as a developer, uh, you can create new VPS enabled locations. So maybe, you know, I'm from uh, central Iowa, which as you can imagine, doesn't have near as many VPS locations as now where I live in Seattle. Uh, so a lot of people are like, hey, I need to drive into town to play Pokemon Go. So you, as, a, as a developer or um, if you, you can, we have some APIs that help make it easier for players too, but you can create your own uh, locations or test locations um, so you don't have to go too far. So uh, Lightship Playback allows you to take an AR session that you've recorded on your phone and simulate that in the editor uh, over and over. Uh, so what that could look like is in this example here, uh, you do have to provide a data set, which comes from uh, after you've recorded a session, you can bring that in, uh, which we have documentation for all that. But I just want to illustrate the actual tool itself on how easy it is and how useful it is. Um, so as you're replaying that session, uh, this is a Gandhi statue outside uh, headquarters here in the Ferry Building in C at San Francisco, uh, showing that this is actually feeding all of the uh, all of the features, all of the depth data, all of our modules uh, that you would see in real life on device in the real world. Uh, so everything is running right now. Depth is running. Uh, you can localize the VPS by using that, and makes it super super easy. So. I don't have to go take that walk to test that one little change, that one line of code. I can just play it over and over right here. So how do you get to that point? Um, so in, in your Lightship dashboard, we have what's called the geospatial browser. And that helps you find VPS locations around you or create new ones. Um, so you can inspect them, you can nominate new ones, you can also download the mesh of existing VPS locations. So if you want to make something hyper accurate and uh, hyper realistic relative to a VPS location, well, you can bring in the literal mesh of that location um, to test over and over and see what it's going to be like. We try to get you as far as humanly possible without actually going out in the real world to test things. Um, and this is also, using this tool, this web tool, is also how you get the default anchor payload which uh, is a little bit of a mouthful, but is how you actually will create content relative to that location. So we have some prefabs and some tools and some flows, but they will say, hey, what location are you trying to create content for? And that's what the anchor payload will do for you. So just a quick example of what that looks like. Here we are in San Francisco. We're looking around at some locations. Uh, you can see them loading. Uh, as we as we move around the map, um, here's a great mesh of a location, a VPS activated location. Uh, download that mesh, bring it in, and now we're actually going to have use a couple prefabs here. Essentially, we won't walk through the whole thing, but you, we're going to use some prefabs that we provide, and uh, we're going to have a cube. And this cube with a smiley face on it is uh, I went a little fast. Let's go back. And this cube with a smiley face on it, we're essentially saying, hey. Here, this red object is our, uh, is our VPS location. We've downloaded the mesh. We're placing a cube uh, just to the left of it, just right next to it. And the idea here is we're curating the experience from the Unity editor, but when we show up this location in real life, we want this cube, we want this digital content to appear as well. So we can do that all from our computer, uh, and then when we actually get up, go to that location, and use VPS to localize. There's the cube uh, floating there in the grass, it's kind of small in this example. Um, but we did all that without actually having to move anything but our fingers. So then, again, um, once you've curated that content from your editor, your VPS experience can come to life in real life. And just stole some examples from the Ingress team here of their VPS experience because it's super, super cool. Um, so now your users are prepared to go out in the real world, scan a location, uh, and have a super hyper accurate VPS uh, experience. Um, and you did all that without moving too much. So we try to make that super, super easy. And in this example, you know, we've gotten out there and now we're having, having something really cool happen. Um, so that it's, I think it's an, a shiny example of like what you can do with location-based AR and geo spatial tools. So what will you build? 
uh, you know, we try to build, we try to give you a lot of tools to let your creativity run free. I think as a game company, we've done some cool stuff. Uh, hopefully, you all agree and have seen have played some of our games. Um, but you know, the purpose of this talk is just to say, hey, we've done some cool stuff. We're trying to make that cool stuff accessible to you to build cool stuff, um, and you know, talk about how we glue some of those pieces together. So, uh, covering how can we can use mapping to help people explore the world around them, get out uh, and do that together. How to enhance your application with these immersive augmented reality experiences, these hyper-realistic experiences. Uh, how to create these location-based experiences, so rewarding players for going to certain places or doing very specific experiences at locations. And then how Lightship helps you iterate on these development times very, very quickly uh, through suite web in the Unity Editor tools, trying to make your life as easy and convenient uh, as possible. And we talked about some design guidelines. Take our survey, tell us how these talks are, if you like them, if you like me, and uh, give us feedback on how it's going. Um, aside from that, I think we're on to questions. Oh, sorry, oh, leave that, it's a good call, I'll leave that out. Everybody's like, take our survey, scan the QR code, go. Um, but other than that, we can go on to uh, any questions that people have. Yeah, please. Nice. All right. So, question one, um, with VPS coverage map, pulling that in, can you limit that to certain things so your game is limited to the, the currently activated VPS plot that you only want to do? Yes. Um, it, it would be more of a manual filtering exercise, but you totally can. So I think the way you do that is, uh, we don't have a built-in way of saying, hey, only get me these three or any of these 10. But you, you know, you get, you get 10 and you're like, are, are any of these my locations? Yes, yes, no, no, no. So you uh, can do it, but not like a, uh, not a lot of you parameters. Use, use the ID from the coverage map and you map it against, filter it against those IDs. Yep, 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 okay. exactly. Uh, question two. Um, da -da 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 -da. So in, in your example, uh, 3.0, when you're localizing, you see the like, AR cues that you are actually localizing, so dots moving up in the phone. Is that going to be in 3.0? Because in 2.0, I had to build that in myself. Great question and a very relevant question. Um, if I can find that, here it is. Um, so you're referring to uh, these effects that are happening here as as, as we like. Phone, yeah, I had to add that in myself yep. in 2.0, and yeah. And then as we actually start localizing, you get um, dots floating up. I saw some of these cute dots um, right about. Now, there you go. yeah. So, um, short answer is not right now. Um, we we've been started working really closely with an awesome UX team, which has been really really nice. Because uh, actually, Jamika and I have been working on this little demo, and I don't have an eye for design at all. So they're like, well, let's do the little dots thing, and I'm like, why? It's like because users, it's telling users something's happening. You know, yeah. like they're getting some sort of feedback. Um, so that's led to some conversations about, well, can we? build some sort of UX library or UI library where you can just access these things really easily. So the short answer is no, but it's top of mind. Um, hopefully, hopefully at some point we do, because I think that's something that uh, is not as intuitive maybe as developers. I don't always think about like, well, does it make sense to the user? Because I just took the time to build it and I feel good about it. Okay, thanks. Uh, question three, see I wrote them down so I don't forget. No, go for it, yeah. <laughs> love it. Uh, will playback, the current example playbacks in Lightship 2 work if we record a, a setting in Lightship 3? Or is there a new completely build that we got to pull to, to record a scene for playback? No, it should be the same data sets. So if you took if you took AR session data sets from whenever, weeks, months ago, it should still work in 3.0 playback. 